little by little things are falling into place. Uh, but I've been mean, really uh, waiting very patiently for this moment, Brother Timothy. I was very impressed with the message you gave us on Skype with all the PowerPoints and everything. I was tremendously impressed, and the study was spot on, as the British would say. And from then, I've been uh, looking forward for him to come up and, uh, you know, press in this way and be able to share a message with us. And that moment's here. So, Brother Tim, would you please come? I'm very honored to share the pulpit with him. He's been a, he's a missionary that I look up to, uh, especially for all the many years that he's been ministering in different parts of the world, especially most of the years, 40 years in Luxembourg. That, that might, Brother Tim, would you please come? that it's a real privilege as I had to uh, bring the word of God to um, the group this evening and uh, as I look through the plexiglass here I, I feel like uh, Paul writing in first Corinthians 13 you know through a glass darkly but it's uh, actually a little clearer than I think what he had in mind. Kathy and I, can you hear me in the back? Do I need to project a little more? All right. Um, Kathy and I have been here since the middle of December. It's been just about three months since we moved from uh, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. It's called the Grand Duchy, not because it's so big, but because the head of state is a Grand Duke. It is, uh, has a population of about um, well, as many people as live in Malaga, about uh, 600,000 people. And we served there uh, for 43 years until December of last year in uh, some church planning ministries and various other things. And uh, we have left behind there a national pastor who is a Frenchman we've known for many years and a number of very keen and committed families. Uh, men are being trained for uh, ministry along with their wives and uh, their families. It's a dynamic group, but they have not been able to meet together on a regular basis as you've been able to meet since last March. Uh, everything's been by Zoom, with the exception of a few weeks in the fall. I mean, in the autumn months, we were able, we thought, to start up again but uh, in the meantime, they have not had the kinds of freedoms that you have had yeah. uh, to meet like this in a group. So I hope you count your blessings. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for people who are distant from each other. Tonight we would like to go to a book in the Bible, which perhaps you haven't read for a while. Pastor Sam asked me if I would use PowerPoints, and uh, although generally when I like to give the Word of God, I don't use a PowerPoint unless we're really in a, in a teaching situation, in a classroom setting, but why not? Uh, we're here in the afternoon, and this is a little different from what you're used to. I hope that having a visual support will not um, cause you to become too lazy but that it will be a, a little support to maintain your attention and see the direction in which we're going. We'd like to talk tonight about uh, Jonah. I'm going to call him the mirror prophet. And I think you'll see as we go through our study why I'm going to call him a mirror prophet. In the book of Jonah, Jonah could first of all see himself for who he was. As far as we know, the author of this Old Testament book, which is found right after the little book of Obadiah, in case you're looking, in your Bible, and right before Micah, in case you're, uh, it's easy to get lost, isn't it, in those 12 little uh, minor prophetic books in the Old Testament. 
<clears throat> Jonah is a book of which the author is unknown. I expect it would have been Jonah himself, but it is not signed by anyone. But certainly in this book, we see something about Jonah's own character, the strengths and weaknesses, and primarily the, the weaknesses. But we're also going to see that uh, Jonah is a person who typifies the people of Israel and is a mirror, so to speak, in which the people of Israel can see themselves. And we'll talk about that in just a moment here. We're, we're all going to, also going to see that the book of Jonah points us to Jesus Christ, who mentions Jonah on a number of occasions in the New Testament Gospels. And of course, this book, although it is in the Old Testament, has something to tell us. In the church age, God has not set aside forever the people of Israel, but right now he's working with his church, which is composed of Jew and Gentile, baptized by the same Holy Spirit into one body, so that it makes no difference what your ethnicity might be. The Jews have no longer any advantage over Gentiles in their relationship to God, in their proximity to God, or even in their mission. And we'll talk a moment about that as well this evening. Um, let's spend a minute just to give a little bit of background that I think is essential if we're going to appreciate the book of Jonah in its larger con context. We want to talk a little bit about the people of Israel and their mission. Because very often we forget the reason for the existence of the Jewish people. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament and the basic narrative of the Old Testament, you'll remember that in, in roughly 2000 BC, it's probably 2150 or something like that, God had a word for Abram, who lived in a pagan city, a polytheistic city, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And according to Genesis 12, 1 to 3, we read that Jehovah had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And note the promises in Genesis 12, 2 and following. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. That actually is an imperative in the original text. Be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Right from the beginning, as the people of Israel are framed through the call of Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, Abram and his descendants are on a mission. They are to be a missionary people. And as we go through the Old Testament, we find out more and more about that. This land, which is going to be given to Abram and his descendants, well, it looks very promising, doesn't it? It looks a little bit like some of the mountains that I've seen in Spain. I'll tell you what, this is arid country. Actually, I've cheated a little bit because this is a photo that um, I took from Jordan into Israel. So into the, the southern part of the Negev in Israel, you see on, the, on the, the border over here, into the land of Israel. And in Abram's time, I guess it was a little more wooded than it is today. Right now, it's just rocks. And uh, it's like Spain in the heat of summer, 50 degrees centigrade, arid. If you're not constantly drinking water, you're dead. But in those days, this was the promised land. What is God going to do with these people? When you go to Genesis chapter 15, you see that God officially makes his covenant with the people of uh, the people who would be descended from Abram. 
and he says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to eventually change your name. And you remember how he, he walks through these cut pieces of sacrifice by, uh, so to speak, making a covenant with himself, making a promise to himself while Abram is in a, du in a, in a deep uh, slumber or almost stupor. God is making an unconditional promise to Abraham, as his name would later be, and to his descendants that he's going to make them a missionary people. This is carried on in the book of Exodus. When you go to Exodus chapter 19, and the people enter the land of Israel, or prepare to enter the land of Israel, they're still in the desert of Sinai at this point, God gives them some very specific instructions here in chapter 19, verses 3 to 6, and some promises that are conditional this time. Verse 3, Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, he's speaking there of the covenant that he will be giving in the book of the covenant a few chapters later, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. The term there suggests the crown jewels. Some of you have seen the crown jewels yeah. in London. You will be a very special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So there's the offer. It is a conditional offer. If you do this, then I will do that. If you will follow my commandments, I'm going to make you into that special people that is able to fulfill the mission to which I've called you as the descendants of Abraham. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we see how Solomon, in his prayer of dedication of the temple, reflects this understanding that the people of Israel, the Jews, are indeed to be a missionary people. Let me read from chapter 8, beginning in verse 41, which is obviously in the middle of a, a lengthy uh, context where Solomon is, is saying, if people come to the temple, then, Lord, would you please hear their prayers? Verse 41, Moreover, concerning a stranger that is a foreigner that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake. Notice the parenthesis now. For they shall hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand and of thy stretched out arm. When he shall come and pray toward this house, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee, as do thy people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have builded is called by thy name. You see the missionary emphasis. All people who come to the temple of the living God in Jerusalem, built by Solomon, by God's express instructions, must know that he is the only true God, and they must be called to worship him. So, Lord, would you please hear their prayers when they approach you? Even if they are not Jews, mm -hmm. the place for non-Jews to come to know God and worship God is right here in this place. So hear their prayers when that happens. Psalm 66, verse 8. Let me have you look through a number of examples from the Psalms which underscore this universal mission that God had in mind for the Jewish people. Psalm 66, verse 8. O oh, bless our God. Note the first person plural pronoun. Our God, the God of us. 
ye people. Actually, the original text has the word people in the plural. Amim, ye peoples. The idea is a, of a, a, collect, a collection of nations. Bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. This is a call to the nations to know God and to bless his name. Look at another example from Psalm 72, verse 11. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Keep going in the Psalms. Well, let's read verse um, 17 as well. I'm sorry, I, I skipped that one there. 72.17, I wanted to draw your attention as well to that one. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. And men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Mm. Psalm 98, verse 3. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. One of the shortest psalms in the Psalter. Oh, praise the Lord. What's the next word? Oh. All ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. The, the mission of praise is directed to the Jewish people and also to Gentiles who come to know God through the witness of the people of Israel. One more example from Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43, verses 11 and 12. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed, and when there, are, uh, when there was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. To whom is God speaking? Who is the you and the ye here? If you go back to the very beginning of the chapter, you find out that the Lord is speaking to Jacob. Now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. The mission of the Jews is to make the God of the Jews known among the nations. Amen. There are many Jewish people around the world today who have absolutely no idea what the purpose of the creation of Judaism, or of the Jewish people, actually was, and remains to be. Their mission is to picture God to the nations by being a unique people, set apart to Him, a holy people, a humble people, a people who prosper in every way under his merciful hand as they live in a land that was given to them forever, but from which they've been banished more than once because of their disobedience, and to which one day they will be restored when God's purposes for history are fulfilled. That's the mission of the Jewish people. You cannot appreciate the book of Jonah unless you have this right in the front of your memory. Now, the people of Israel are some of the main characters behind the scenes, and they are the ones who are ultimately really addressed in the book of Jonah. This is a book for Jewish people to read about their mission. But, of course, Jonah himself is one of the main characters of the story as well, isn't he? I don't know if you're aware of it, but Jonah is mentioned more than uh, once in the uh, the Bible, more than just in the book of Jonah. And if you go to the second book of Kings, to chapter 14, you will find his name is mentioned in that book as well. 
2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25. This is talking about uh, one of the kings of Israel, Jeroboam II. I don't know if you um, have ever learned all the names of all the kings of Israel and all the kings of Judah in order and their dates. I haven't. I get them all confused. Especially the ones from the northern kingdom. The ten tribes, uh, you know, there were 20 kings in the north and there were 20 kings in the south if you count all the ones that served as kings only for a couple of months. There are 20 and 20, so that's easy to remember. But getting them all in order and remembering where they fit in history, uh, it, it, I have to always look back at a chart. Jeroboam II is one of those kings in the northern ten tribes who rules for a very long time, 41 years. And it's counterintuitive because in the north, which is a, a godless area of Israel, these are people who have, from the time of the division of the kingdom under the sons of Solomon, Jer uh, Jeroboam I and Rehoboam, when the kingdoms split up between the ten northern tribe and the tribe of Judah and Benjamin in the south, up in the north, these people have been idolaters. They have rejected the message of God, and they're about as far away as you can be from uh, a people who would expect God's uh, fulfilling his promises and being merciful to them. They're, they're just a godless lot, as we're going to see yet tonight. Mm -hmm. And yet, under the time of Jeroboam II, uh, Israel in the north experiences a time of tremendous prosperity. It's amazing. We'll read about it in the book of Amos in a few moments. And it is during that time that this particular prophet emerges and gives a very nice piece of news to a godless king, Jeroboam II. Look at what it said in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. He restored the coast of Israel, he's speaking about the king Jeroboam II, from the entering of Hamat unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Mr. Fidgen, or if you prefer, Mr. Dove, Yonah, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath-Hefeh. Same Jonah, who got gulped up by a whale in the book that everybody's heard of. Jonah, the son of Amittai, has a great piece of news for Jeroboam, the godless king. You're going to be able to take back the property which um, had been taken away from many of the, ki the previous kings of Israel uh, because of the influences of the people of Syria. You look back through the Old Testament history and you find that the the Syrian people, also known as Aram, were always beating at the door of the northern tribes. And they would come down and invade and take people away into imprisonment. And uh, the, these were a real thorn in the side of the people of Israel. Now Jonah comes on the scene and he says to Jeroboam, uh, you're going to get much of that territory back. I, I imagine that Jonah must have been a very popular bloke. Uh, who doesn't like to listen to a, pro to a prophet who gives you good news, right? The other main characters in the book of Jonah are the Ninevites. The Ninevites uh, find a, a reference back in Genesis chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. We won't take the time to read that passage, but you can do it on your own. And you will find that the city of Nineveh was built by Nimrod. And uh, it is a city, the vestiges of which still exist today, very close to the, uh, the famous city of Mosul, of Mosul in Iraq, <coughs> which uh, during the Iraq war some years ago was very much in the news. And I imagine we'll still get back in the news one of these days. It's one of the, the oldest um, inhabited cities of the world close to Damascus. Um, it, 
this is this is really really old stuff that goes way way back after the dividing of the nations in Genesis chapter 10. So those are the main characters in the plot. Keep in mind where things are. <clears throat> Nineveh is right up here. <clears throat> Notice that Mosul is right across the river from ancient Nineveh. And so we are on the Tigris River Valley going, coming up through uh, what today is Iraq. The area that um, we're going to be talking about here where Jonah comes from is down on the other side along the Mediterranean Sea. Um, Lachish is uh, about halfway between Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, which was a Philistine territory many years ago, even in Jonah's day. And uh, of course, Tel Aviv did not exist at that particular time. Jonah himself came from uh, a northern area here, right about where my little red uh, pointer is. It would have been very close to uh, the city of Nazareth. You've heard of Nazareth, I know. And it would have been a short walk for him to uh, go over to the coast side by, by on the other side of Mount Carmel and go down the coastal road to um, get a ticket to a far country, which is exactly, as you know, what he did. Um, what about this prophet Jonah? Was he the hero of the story of Jonah? It's interesting, when you read through Old Testament narrative discourse, to ask yourself the question, who is the focus of attention? Was it Jonah? Was the hero maybe a pagan sailor, or the whole group of them? How about the fish? He's not called a whale, by the way. It's just a large fish. We don't know what kind it was. Were the Ninevites who repented the hero of the story? I'm not asking you to give an answer necessarily out loud, but think about it. How about the worm in chapter 4? We're not going to talk about the worm because we're going to focus tonight on chapter 1. That little worm is really a little, little, little worm. <laughs> Compared to the big fish and a lot of other things in chapter 1 that are big, 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 big city, big fish, big storm, little worm that eats the plant in the end. That seems to be a pretty important factor in the, in the account. Maybe the worm is the hero. <laughs> because the worm really showed us a whole lot about Jonah by the time we get to the end of the account. I'd like to propose to you that the hero of the story is the God of Israel. The book of Jonah is not so much about Jonah or the fish or the Ninevites or the worm, or the pagan sailors, but it is about the God of Israel who is on a mission to Gentile people whom Jonah despised. He hated them. He hated the Ninevites. He did not want them to be saved, and he was absolutely convinced that if he did what God told him to do, wouldn't you know it, those hated Ninevites were going to be converted. Oh, perish the thought. How Jonah is a mirror prophet, as we mentioned, he mirrors the people of Israel, and we're going to see that in a moment. He mirrors the church. There are many things here that we can see that we can apply to ourselves, even though we are uh, not related to the promises of Abraham in exactly the same way as Jewish people were and are. He points to the nations as well and reveals something uh, to us about people who, who seem to be outside the people of promise. And we have some things to learn about that. And there's much more that we can say about that. Maybe we can do that at another time. And of course, the book of Jonah, as we said earlier, points us as well to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That is why I'm going to call Jonah a mirror prophet. Now let's look at Jonah chapter 1 and see something about the action. And uh, just give me some feedback. How many of you have already at least once read the book of Jonah for yourself? Okay, so most of you are familiar with the, the account, but maybe you haven't read it exactly from quite this perspective. So if you have your Bible, uh, look at chapter 1. There are four chapters in this little book. And verse 1. Now the word of the Lord of Jehovah came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. That's complicated, isn't it? Do you find those instructions hard to understand? Arise, go, cry. Three things. Arise, that's a typical Hebrew way of saying, get ready now, that you, you have to be moving toward action. And I want you to leave where you are, the north of the land of Israel, and I want you to go to Nineveh, go north toward the Syrian area, then go down the Tigris River Valley and find the city of Nineveh and cry against it. Call out. And the reason is simple. Their wickedness, their evil, has come up before me, before my face. But Jonah, as you know, is a runner and a snorer. He flees. Verse 3 says, but Jonah rose up to flee. He got up, didn't he? He rose up. It's the same word. Arise. He rose up. Different verb tense. He rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah flees. We don't know exactly uh, what those boats looked like. This is a, a guess that uh, you find as a, as a carved bas-relief on a sarcophagus, a bone box from the Middle East. But note that he did not go north and east off of the map toward Nineveh. He went west. No one knows where Tarshish, Tarshish actually was. There's been speculation, and we're living in a part of the world where it's very tempting to say, well, it was actually, um, sorry, right here in this part of, of Spain, maybe in Cadiz, in Cadiz, Cadiz, Cadiz. I've learned how to pronounce these Spanish. In um, Tarsesus, an ancient portion of the pre-Roman world that uh, had a provincial name that reminds us of the, the word Tarshish. There are some people who think that it was actually the little town of Utica, or Utica, close to Carthage in what is today Tunisia. Others suggest that it was the island of Sardinia. We're not quite sure. You don't have to know exactly where it was to get the idea. Because Jonah decides to move from the north of the land of Israel, where he is down here, and he probably takes the trade route across Mount Carmel and, and uh, maybe gets on a donkey, he could have walked it, and goes down to Joppa, which is one of the ancient sea, sea ports of, of, the, of the ancient world. And um, it was a Phoenician port that was used in his day to uh, do a lot of business all around the Mediterranean basin. And these arrows show you where these boats would go for trading, down to Egypt, up to Cyprus, over here, to uh, Libya, and uh, these major cities here were all Phoenician trading points, and this was about as far west as you could go if you were on a Phoenician trading vessel up into this area here and into Sicily. This is filled with irony. We're going to find out later if we read the book of Jonah exactly why Jonah did what he did. It's interesting, isn't it? Because everything lined up for him to succeed in this mission. 
Sometimes we, we think that we are in the will of God when, circumstance, when circumstances line up in our favor. God did not stop him from getting a ticket. The doors were open. Maybe the weather was good. There were tickets available aboarding, aboard this trading vessel. It must be, I don't even know that he thought about whether or not it was the will of God. He knew that it was very obviously not the will of God for him to go west rather than northeast. But he's able, able to make the trip up to a certain point. We keep reading, and we find out that uh, he's a sleeper, he's a snorer. Verse 4, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. You need to remember that seafaring peoples, the Phoenicians in particular, when they executed these uh, trips in the Mediterranean, knew exactly when they could uh, safely make their voyages. Somebody mentioned uh, earlier on in the service tonight that the, you, you're not sure that the good weather is really here in the Malaga region until you get to the month of June. I find that very hard to believe, but I'll take your word for it. Uh, this seems to me to be summertime. I mean, you don't get better weather than this in Luxembourg in the summertime. In June, we have this. We might even have it for two weeks straight, you know, and then the rains come back from London. So for them to be in the middle of their trading zone in a time of the year when they could safely travel, and then to have this mighty tempest, a great wind, is a complete surprise to these sailors. These men are not going to be traveling during a time of the year when they are likely to have bad weather. You remember what happened to the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts when he said, no, no, we shouldn't travel, let's stay put. No, 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 we, we have to make one more trip because we want to make some more money. All right, you're going to be in trouble in three weeks. You know, they, they were lost in the middle of the Mediterranean and finally landed uh, over close to, to Rome in Malta. Um, this is a surprise. This is like having snow in July. And so if we know that, then we understand verse 5. Then the mariners, the sailors, were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. Kind of an interesting play on words there because verse 4 says that the Lord sent out a great wind. That's the same verb that is translated in verse 5, cast forth. God threw the wind and the sailors threw out the ballast from the ship because they knew that um, if they didn't get rid of some of that weight, they were going to go down under. And then the supreme irony in the end of verse 5, but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. The whole story is a going down. You know, God says, go over to Nineveh, but when you carefully look at these words that are used deliberately in the text, you find that Jonah goes down to Joppa, verse 3, and goes down into the side of the ship. And by the time you end up at the end of chapter 1, you find that he's gone down to the depths of the sea, too. The trajectory of Jonah is very negative. Not only has he gone down into the sides of the ship, but the end of verse 5 says that he lay and he was fast asleep. Now, there are some people that pay good money to be able to sleep in such circumstances. Yeah. They go to psychiatrists, psychologists, pastors, doctors. They take pills to be able to sleep when it's quiet. But to sleep in the middle of the tempest, that's amazing. And the shipmaster... Uh, is very surprised, to put it lightly. Verse 6 says the shipmaster came to him. I imagine he must have pawed through, um, you know, the, the rubbish down below decks that was heaving back and forth and uh, looking maybe for something else that he could throw overboard. And he came upon a sleeping body. He, he is flabbergasted. What meanest thou, O sleeper? What on earth are you doing here? 
Arise, call upon thy God. And that's an echo of the very first verse. Arise, cry out. God said this to Jonah. Get up and cry against Nineveh. The shipmaster says, probably in Aramaic, not in Hebrew, Arise, call out. But call upon thy God. The shipmaster assumes, of course, that Jonah is a polytheist, like everybody else aboard. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. Now that's the next step. The sailors are going to, uh, to talk with each other and uh, see if they can figure out who is to blame for all of this. Um, I'm a little ahead of myself with the slide, but uh, stick with me. We'll get to Amos in just a moment. Uh, they, they are going to um, cast the lots to see who is the guilty party. Before, I, I want you to see why Jonah is the guilty party here and why his being fingered by God is so ironic. You must understand something about what was going on in the land of Israel. And let me just very quickly move through a couple of passages in the book of Amos. We're supposed to be out of here by six. So. <laughs> Can you find the book of Amos? It's just a few pages beforehand. And if you look at these passages, you will find that the people of Israel were very much like the pagan sailors that we find portrayed in, in Jonah chapter 1. And so, the book of Jonah is a mirror for the people of Israel. Amos chapter 2, verse 8. They lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. The Jews, who are sent on a mission by God to the nations, pray to false gods. They are an idolatrous people. Verse 12. He gave the Nazarites wine to drink. These are people who were supposed to be dedicated to God and were not supposed to drink wine at all. You gave, them, you gave them wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. Chapter 6, verse 6. They drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. They have no spiritual sensitivity to the persecution of God's chosen people where that occurs. Chapter 8, verse 14. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, the God of Samaria, they worship. O Dan liveth, and the manor of Be'er Sheba liveth. Even they shall fall and never rise up again. These are the names of the false gods that the Jews in the northern region of Israel worship. God's people crave, crave creature comforts. You see them in chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, they pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. Now that is an interesting way of talking about covetousness. They pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. Have you ever panted with desire after the dust of the earth that is sitting on the head of a poor person? Because if you could just have a little bit of dust sitting on the head of a poor person, you could increase your own wealth. They turn aside the way of the meek, and a man and his father will go into, in into the same maid to profane my holy name. Chapter 6, verses 6, 4 to 6. Come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal. Multiply transgressions and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years, and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, and proclaim and publish the three offerings, the free offerings, for this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God's people cheated to get what they craved. We don't have time to read through these passages. I'll put them on the screen, and you can look at these passages at a later point. Just maybe I can underscore chapter 5, verses 10 to 13. 
they hate him that rebuketh in the gate. That is the place in the Jewish city where there are decision makers. So if you say, I don't agree, that's not the right thing to do. They hate him that rebuketh. And they abhor him that speaketh uprightly, for as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye have not dwelt in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them, for I know your manifold transgressions. They make dishonest gain. God's people copied the moral decadence of their pagan neighbors. We already read about it. Immorality. Base sexual immorality. And they refused any correction. Now you would think that instead of having the phrase God's people, God's people, God's people, God's people, God's people, and then the rest of these statements, you would think that every one of these sentences would be about the Ninevites, right? The Ninevites prayed to false gods. Well, yeah, sure they did. The Ninevites craved creature comforts. They cheated to get what they craved. They copied the moral decadence. Well, they were the pagan neighbors. They were morally decadent. And they arrogantly refused any correction. But it's God's people here who are doing these things. So just as Jonah flees God's mission and falls asleep, so God's own people, Israel, have fled him and fallen asleep. Jonah is a mirror of the people of Israel. He shows them up to be what they truly are. What a contrast with the Lord Jesus, who when he was in a boat in the middle of a storm, was not fleeing his father's mission. He was asleep, but... He was not asleep because he wanted to escape anything. And when he was awakened by the disciples who said, don't you care that we're perishing? He said, you have little faith. Why are you afraid? Contrast, yeah. Why? The same thing happened on the Sea of Galilee that happened when we see the events of Jonah chapter 1. The storm was still. It makes me ask the question of myself. And I'd like you to think about it for yourself. Because I think this is one of the purposes of the book of Jonah, to help the reader put himself into the spotlight and to help us to ask ourselves, are we fleeing the mission that God has given to us, and are we asleep? Let's read the rest of chapter 1, and then we'll, we'll finish off for this evening. Verse 7 has said that the mariners proposed to cast lots. And so they cast lots, and the lot, end of verse 7, fell upon Jonah. I love the way this is expressed. Let us cast lots. So they cast lots, and the lot fell. <laughs> it, it's that ding, 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 that one, two, three cadence that builds suspense. And wouldn't you know it, here are these pagan sailors who are very superstitious and they believe that somehow the forces of nature are going to reveal the guilty party. And wouldn't you know it, this, in this particular case, it's not the forces of nature, but that it's a sovereign God who is using the superstition of the sailors to fulfill his own plans for Jonah and the Ninevites. And now the questions tumble out of their mouths, verse 8. They said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Hey, let, let, me, let me see your papers. <laughs> what do you do for a living? And whence comest thou? Where do you come from? This is the Guardia Fili. Uh, let me see your, your driver's license. What is thy country, and of what people art thou? Let me know your ethnicity. Are, are you, are you, uh, you shouldn't be here. What, what's going on? Listen to Jonah's testimony. I don't know if he's still wiping the sandman out of his eyes or not, but I think he's awake now. And uh, if he has put his hand in a clay pot to pull out the black pebble and everybody else has a white one, 
and he has been fingered by God, he is going to admit now who he is. Verse 9. He said unto them, I am an Ibrit, a Hebrew. It's a word that's not used very often in the Old Testament. We know who the Hebrews are. It means wanderer. Uh, today we might call it um, immigrant. Maybe illegal immigrant. The Habiru in the ancient world were people who wandered around looking for a job to do even though they weren't part of the native population. It was not a nice word. You wouldn't use this word for yourself, to identify yourself under normal circumstances. But he calls himself a Hebrew. But he adds this. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Whoa. Jonah, you fear the creator God. Then what are you doing here? And then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. They said unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. This, these, are nice, these are nice chaps, I think, you know. Because under normal conditions, I would have expected that a pagan sailor on a Phoenician craft would say, Oh, it's you that is, is guilty. Um, pull out the sword and take off his head. But they ask him the question, what shall we do to you so that all of us will come happily to, to port? And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. <laughs> so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. But notice verse 13, the Phoenicians are not after his neck. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. So these are not men who, who want to execute Jonah. They feel this is far <coughs> extreme, what he's proposing to them. And wherefore, they cried unto Jehovah, the Lord. This is a mariner's, a pagan mariner's prayer. These men have never prayed to Jehovah before. They prayed to Baal, to Baal to Astarte, to El, but not to Yahweh. They've never prayed to the Lord. And this is not um, one of those, you know, prayers where you have an organ playing gently in the background, you know, to give a, an appropriate mood, to have a, a worshipful uh, ceremonial um, setting. This, this is a prayer of panic. We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. That's pretty good theology for a pagan, I think. <coughs> yes. And so they took up Jonah, and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from, their, from her raging. I, my friends, these men must have been absolutely floored. That is raw power. I don't know if you've spent a lot of time aboard a boat on the, in the middle of the Mediterranean or uh, on the open sea. How many of you have traveled on the open sea? Okay. Uh, if you do it on a, you know, on a cruise ship, unless you're really in one of those really bad storms that you see on YouTube, uh, on a cruise ship, you know, it stays pretty steady. But on one of these little Phoenician ships, if you're in the middle of a tempest, you're going up and down. You've got your sea legs. And when it goes from that to a flat calm in minutes, that is impressive. And verse 16 then is perfectly understandable. The men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice of the Lord and made vows. I wish I knew the end of that story. <laughs> I really would like to know what happened to those mariners after they left this experience. They feared the Lord. Jonah said he feared the Lord. Did he really fear the Lord? He picks up the black pebble. I fear the Lord. Looks to me like a pious platitude. You know, platitude 
comes from a word, a French word that means flat, plat. I didn't check my dictionary, but I suspect that even that the English word flat might be derived from the French word plat, flat. It's, it has no character, it has no substance. This is not a fruit bowl filled uh, you know, with abundant uh, fruit. This is just saying nothing at all. But the sailors, they fear the Lord. It, it, it makes us ask the question, does the people of Israel fear the Lord? And the answer is no. Jesus teaches us the fear of the Lord, doesn't he? It is his will for us to have a proper fear of him that is awe, respect, a, a worship of him that drives us to serve him. So what does Jonah reflect in us? Does he reflect in us who are part, if you have trusted Christ, of the church? Are we fleeing our mission? God has sent us on a mission. You know, it's very easy for us in this part of the world to be people who flee. That's right. Yeah. Right? I won't ask you to raise your hand to think about this. What was the major reason for you to come to the Malaga region? One of the gentlemen who works in our house said, there's one reason why people come to Andalusia today. It's the sunshine. <laughs> it's the pension. I can forget the life I had before, and I can go to the beach, or I can be with my friends, or for many people it's a drinking culture, and just spend the rest of my days running away from whatever. And you know, it is possible for a Christian who comes to this part of the world to be a person in flight. We don't want to do that. Amen. I hope you don't want to. Because until the last day of your life, if you have trusted in Christ, you're on a mission, and so am I, even when you're a pensioner. Maybe um, Jonah mirrors a certain sleepiness. It is possible for us to have the mentality that we just want to uh, not only flee our responsibilities, but close the world out so entirely that we're in the belly of the boat. Does um, maybe the book of Jonah reflect in us a certain fear of loss? We, we should take some time, and you can do this later on uh, this week, to look further at uh, chapters 2, 3, and 4, and think about what <clears throat> Jonah may have thought he was going to lose. Because I think that Jonah was very concerned that he was going to lose his credibility. He wanted to see the judgment of God fall upon evil people. And there might be people in Southern Europe whom we do not like and with whom we want very little to do. And if we interact with them, we may fear that our lives may be in danger, that we're going to lose our time, that people will take things away from us that we would really like to, to hold on to. The opposite, of course, is what we would hope the book of Jonah would mirror, obedience among God's people, and vigilance instead of sleepiness and the fear of the Lord. That's the right kind of fear that we should have. I trust as we go into this new week, and as God brings various challenges uh, our way to minister uh, in our circle of acquaintances and friends, that we will be wide awake and not asleep like Jonah was. Amen. That we will not run away from the mission that he has given us. Because it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter what kind of health you're in, if you know Christ, and if I know Christ, like the Jews, and even more so, we are on a mission. Amen. And all of us have a circle of friends and acquaintances, and we need to go out and, and find those people, even if they are ones with whom we find it difficult to interact. 
and pray for them and seek to reach them. Amen. May God help us to uh, be uh, eager hearers of his word and doers as well. Father, we thank you for this little book in the Old Testament. And we, we want to learn from Jonah. Help us to <coughs> not be like the people from whom he came, the godless people of Israel in the north. But help us to be really the church of Jesus Christ who stands out from the crowd and that is a holy people. Help us to pursue the mission that you have given to us. And help us to have a right fear of you. Help us to know what it is to serve you in a way that is worthy of the gospel. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.